What's going on, everybody? Welcome into episode seven of the Deal Spotlight, where we are covering Chevron, Hess, and Exxon and the battle for Guyana. Absolutely great episode. I am thrilled to be joined by Bennett Williams, managing partner over at Aclarar Group, LLC. Um, Bennett is somebody who I have an opportunity to meet over the past couple of months. An absolute you know, wealth of information. He comes on the show and really as an expert in M and A and, you know, commercial negotiations when it's specifically having worked at Chevron for years, knowing the ins and outs of this market, he was the perfect guest to bring on, to break down really this entire crazy situation where you've got Chevron buying Hess and really only buying Hess for the value of the Guyana assets. Exxon coming in over the top and saying, well, wait a second. We actually have a right to purchase Guyana, uh, Hess's Guyana interest first, both companies aren't interested in Hess at large. They're only interested in this 30% sp stake. Um, you know, we, we talk all about first kind of the offshore M and a space, you know, talk about, you know, mainly why the, the, the growth of production is, is, is dominated by the offshore space. We then, um, get a little bit also on Bennett's background. He talks us through some of the key KPIs as you look to do a, an M&A deal specifically that includes some offshore stuff. We then dive in specifically to the deal. He gives us some great insights into, you know, how you, how he would value this deal. Some of the things to look at, we, we, we break down Javier Blias's great article where he kind of covers the change of control metrics there. So all in all, a great episode guys really appreciate Bennett for coming on the show. Um, you know, I'm about to turn it over here, but as always, guys, check us out, www.energynewsbeat.com. The description below is going to have all of the links to be able to stay up to speed with the show. But until then, guys, I'm going to turn it over to Bennett and myself. Here's the deal. Thanks for joining us on the Deal Spotlight. How are you doing today? Very well, thank you. This is this is going to be really fun. You know, this is a we focused, you know, in the first, I would say, five to seven episodes of this podcast, specifically on kind of small onshore A&D, some mergers and acquisitions. We did Oxy Crown Rock uh, last week. We just got done covering some oil field service mergers where I got to learn, really learn uh, a, a lot about an industry that I or a segment of the upstream business that I haven't necessarily touched as much. And this has been a deal that's been on my mind for a, for a couple months now, specifically when Exxon came out and decided to challenge this merger between he uh, Chevron and Hess. And really excited to get you on here and discuss all things this deal. You're, 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 you know, I, as we were talking, you know, a month or two ago, you, you your experience lines up exactly with what um, I, I think come what this deal and a lot of the the issues that we'll talk about in this deal. So again, really appreciate um, you coming on. I, I want to start really by setting the table before we dive into the deal. Specifically, first, a little bit on your background, kind of how you got to to, to where you are and, and where you kind of fit in um, and all this stuff. Sure. Uh, so uh, foundationally, I'm an energy economist. I would say it's undergrad, University of Alaska Anchorage economics major, double minor, math, and political science. Then directly to grad school, Colorado School of Mines, with a real focus uh, in the energy game in resource economics. I'd say master's of science in mineral economics with a minor in petroleum engineering. Far so, and few between people know about the MS uh, in the mineral economics program at Mines. Proud graduate of that program as well. So right <laughs> off the bat, you're scoring points with me. Yeah, that, that's my objective opinion, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's a yeah, phenomenal program, very quantitatively focused. And then I wanted the technical foundation to understand uh, inputs I was giving, right? Because the economic function and in industry, you, you kind of the funnel that everything feeds to and just like you want to you want to be able to QC that stuff and not just accept it on faith. Um, and so uh, that led all roads lead to Houston. Then if you're in oil and gas at some point, it seems like. And uh, out of grad school, went with a startup in Houston called EAS. Very high-end, probabilistic uh, asset characterization using Monte Carlo simulation to then feed 10,000 realizations of the world into a portfolio optimization tool. Super black box, never uh, uh, headed for the market uh, penetration envisioned, but uh, the startup was acquired by a Halliburton sub and then... Uh, picked up a project that had gone dormant during the 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 takeover or during during the sale and so uh then delivered that for uh Anadarko which became my entree to move 
effectively from the service side to the producer side, went and started working in Anadarko's A&D shop. And so then Anadarko, about four years there, then Chevron, working in the Chevron upstream, Africa, Latin America headquarters, North America headquarters, and then seven years at Murphy as a business development manager, which in 95 plus percent of the world, business development is sales. But in the upstream, that's A&D or M&A. Mm -hmm. And so then that's what I've been doing. Uh, COVID came to town and got my head chopped off after that negative $37 print on the front month uh, NYMEX contract close. And so then uh, these days I've been uh, recently doing some consulting for a very active uh, startup acquirer in the U.S. Gulf of Mexico. I think they closed like seven deals in 12, 14 months or something. And they're banging on 14,000 barrels a day of production currently from in like less than 18 months. So they're, awesome. they're, they're like, yeah, on fire. Um, no, that, you, you can and see here we are today. Yeah, no, guys, you can see exactly why I wanted to bring Bennett on here because he is uh, he's got a lot of experience specifically dealing with some of the offshore stuff. And, and, and I want to, you know, specifically your time at, at Chevron and all that. I, I want to get a quick kind of again, before we dive in a 30,000 foot view of, of some of the stuff. So in in you, you've seen both sides of both kind of onshore and offshore M&A. You worked kind of around the globe. You have experience working with governments, other national oil companies being in uh, a, a large, big oil company as Chevron. Talk to me a little bit about the difference and maybe the similarities between doing some, you know, an onshore, a primary onshore M&A deal versus offshore. What are some of the considerations and, and, and maybe what are some things that are big that maybe, you know, the general public may not think about as these deals are, are being, uh, um, come together. Well, first, uh, uh, let's talk about the frame, right? This, the, which is getting into a little bit of the Chevron end of the game and decision analysis. And what is it that we mean when we say onshore, right? Because implicit in that is, uh, unconventional onshore resources, right? And once upon a time, onshore was like doing the same game uh, effectively from a risk perspective, as opposed to uh, what we used to call source rock, but now it's unconventional resources. So uh, is that the, the question of the presence of oil is doesn't basically doesn't exist for the unconventional resources. There are hydrocarbons there. It The, the issue becomes how much of them can be mobilized depending on what uh, technology we apply to that. And by technology, I mean probably really which generation and technique of uh, stimulation, right? Because effective, what we're going in is banging on the rock hard enough to create reservoir conditions in a zone around the rock. How effectively can you do that? And then you can start moving some of those long chain hydrocarbons in the unconventional resources. Mm -hmm. What's so different about the offshore before you know the resources there is you're going to go out and spend 100 million 200 million dollars to maybe get some very expensive geologic information about a uh, uh, rock strata and discover that there are no hydrocarbons present so so that gets at one of the in terms of the levels of participation risk sharing and, and joint venture activity which is becomes a hallmark perhaps of the offshore activity, depending on where in the life cycle of that offshore asset you, you are, because the characteristic of the deal or the approach of the deal can be very dependent and who the players are very dependent on where in that asset life cycle you are. Are you at the risk capital stage? All right. Exploration. Mm -hmm. Then when I was at Chevron, Big George, uh, George Kirkland was uh, the, the the king of upshore, uh, upstream international at Chevron. And He'd say, I don't want to own 100% of anything. And, and because, too, there's you've got uh, a lot of concentration risk in the offshore that you don't have in the onshore. So you've got, a, a, you know, just looking at the Gulf of Mexico, and you might have some great big field that's making, you know, 50,000 barrels a day. And it depends on four wells to produce that. And if any one of them waters out, you're screwed. So... So the the there's the the technical risks are are greater the the resource um, concentration I think is, is greater as well and the potential re return so it's a risk reward relationship there but some of the those are some of the characteristics if you're coming into the asset if you're it, it's been discovered but you're in pre production investment is you know the the so but it's a very much a growth asset it's about to come on still a lot of risk on how it's going to perform uh, before you turn it on and get to 
pseudo steady state on the reservoir and then are you where are you in uh, okay it's on production you got production history a lot less risk you 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 have a much better idea of what the reservoir is you've got dynamic performance data then some sense of okay now we know how much reservoir rock we got how many you know what our take points are doing and do we how many additional wells it might take to to get to economically optimized depletion of that resource so, or are you like at late life cycle? And there are some folks that are, that's their niche, right? And they'll come in on mature assets and then figure out how to do it faster, better, cheaper, as well as smaller uh, and hungrier, uh, let's say companies um, will come in and then find bypass potential in those assets. Uh, and really that's a story of what makes sense, what pays out. Mm -hmm. If you are Chevron, the things that make sense to direct your human capital and, and financial capital towards are big things. And something that really is, you know, your crumbs become someone else's banquet mm -hmm. as assets kind of cascade down, down an ownership chain. Um, so that, yeah, that's so, some big picture differences to some of the, you know, then versus the unconventional stuff where you go in and it's going to be okay. We've got um, X amount of acreage looking at uh, lease geometry and we can, and what our spacing we think we can get, uh, at, you know, the utilization factor or, or, you know, some, some fraction of that acreage, then we can get two mile long laterals on, and maybe we got to go bang out a couple mile long wells and, but we got this many locations to work with and, and we, then we've got, we may have some type curves that we can apply to stuff and have some pretty good sense if you've got the production history of what mm -hmm. you, that rock's going to do but uh it's but you know the 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 issues and the questions and the technical risks are uh different and and in many re respects are often significantly lower than than you find in the offshore yeah there's there's two things i i, I want to kind of follow up on that I, I think the first the first question before we kind of get into guyana as a whole and 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 circle back to one of the things you said is you know, your experience specifically working in Africa and Latin America, you know, when, when you're on an onshore deal, specifically if you're trying to buy some acreage in the Permian, I mean, you're dealing with, you know, the tax structure, you're only dealing with the the, the majority of the deal is what's the, as you said, what what's the type curve, how much resources there and how economically efficient can we produce it? When you're when you're looking offshore, you're dealing with multiple different stakeholders versus just the company that you're either acquiring or the acreage that you're going to purchase. What is it like working, and how do governments fit into that a deal analysis? You know, specifically for Chevron Hess, you now got to deal with the the Guyanese government and all this. What does that look like? Have you ever do you find that difficult? Is it hard? What what what's the push pull there? It's it's well, it's different, right? And so there may be, uh, for example. Uh, Guyana, prior to this, was a, a complete frontier country, right? They had great terms because they didn't have any oil, I mean, mm. or any production. It turns out Mother Nature had been bounteous uh, in her in her gifts to in the Guyanese offshore, but there was no uh, there was no production history. So what you'll often find, or there's a real uh, inverse correlation between the prospectivity and the history of of production success in, in a province and how much government take and the terms of that are on offer for that acreage. Uh, and so, you know, great examples, Nigeria, where super perspective offshore and it, and if you go through, through, through the years, you'll find successively greater levels of take as that industry is matured and, and they, you know, they got to handle what they want and then also get a, a, a taste for the economic rents that can be generated by, a successful hydrocarbon extraction. So in Guyana, it started out completely frontier. This curious set of circumstances where uh, Exxon had pretty much the entire offshore in a single block for a really long time. Uh, and, and that's starting to get down to the weeds and the specifics of that. But pulling back into the larger question of that, even in a frontier uh, area where there's been extremely limited a hydrocarbon extraction, I participated in a three block capture at Chevron to get to offshore Liberia. This was right after uh, Ghana popped and though that uh, uh, stretch along offshore West Africa was really hot. So Chevron wanted to get into uh, into Liberia. And, and so uh, 
went through that capture uh, activity that included doing some analysis around terms because you got the Liberian government and the Liberian NOC, which I might characterize as an aspirational national oil company at that point because they didn't have the oil. But and they're looking at their neighbor, Nigeria, saying, yeah, I'll have what he's having. And I'm uh, like, well, wait a minute, guys, here's here's the difference and show them. Uh, going back to like using Wood McKenzie data and looking at government take terms, maturity of provinces and this kind of stuff, develop some analysis to uh, and and deliver that in, in a meeting to uh, Nig uh, Liberian ministers and members of their national oil company when they came to Houston in that time. So that, you know, so that there was an educational aspect of it. Another thing uh, that became particularly with a less experience without the, the the production history without the fiscal overlay that's mature and tested chevron captured three blocks and they had uh maybe wildly disparate terms isn't is a bit strong a characterization but wildly disparate terms i mean and uh, you know very different and so and if you you know you're hoping to find uh, a large enough accumulation it might cross the boundaries of blocks and, and in terms of making investment decisions, you want those to be driven by the probability of success and the prospectivity of, of the target rather than some quirk of, of terms in a particular block. And that's the maybe the, in terms of pulling back one more time to the 100,000 foot view of any oil and gas activity, it all the catechism I learned, it all begins with the rock. <laughs> it, it, that is the, the alpha, but not the omega. Um, because then you start layering on some of this other stuff onshore. And if you're on onshore in Africa, then the question becomes, what's your out? How do you get that oil to market? That becomes critically mm. important. And then if, but you're now we're looking, we're back to the offshore. Okay. We start with the rock. Then we're looking at, uh, you know, some of the, the uh, political risk, security risk, which is one of the reasons in, in an area that may or may not be somewhat unstable, you go more with the offshore because, you know, the farther off, the better, honestly, then, because then there's just less uh, potential for issues there. Then, um, and then, you know, maybe skip ahead a little bit without going through every wrinkle, but uh, looking then at the fiscal term overlay. And so in the case of Liberia here with that fiscal term overlay, then there was a, a follow-on uh, exercise where uh, additional engagement with the national oil company, with the ministry, with the executive uh, uh, branch of the government to get a harmonized set of terms across the three blocks. So then you, what are those those harmonized terms going to be? That's a negotiation. And and so, I mean, we're in one of the most heavily, heavily regulated industries in the world, here in the States even as well. And so the governor, the government is going to be your partner in that business or they're, they're going to be in your business. Mm -hmm. However you view it, they're going to be there. Uh, and so, so it's like, okay, and Chevron was very much, uh, and continues to be full engagement, right? It's like, hey, let's, you know, we're a guest in your country. We want to make, uh, 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 you know, we, we want to engage in a mutually beneficial extraction of the resources that you, that you happen to have. So, so taking that approach very much in, in the exercise, but yeah, they, so they're getting into some, on the off on the offshore stuff that may be different than onshore, and and getting back to that implicit definition to say onshore that's unconventional, and then maybe to further get to that that fiscal and regulatory overlay that's onshore unconventional in the U.S., which then is and and, a, and what differentiates onshore unconventional in the U.S. versus other places then is private ownership of the mineral estate, which mm -hmm. doesn't really happen. Uh, I don't know if it happens anywhere else. But where you got, you know, Bubba and Sissy are getting mailbox money because uh, the the land that Aunt Tilly passed along in the family happened to have, uh, uh, you know, some some wolf camp and sprayberry under it or whatever the story is, you know, for that. But and mm -hmm. that's one of the things that has made the the incredible story of of the explosion of production from the unconventional possible in the U.S. is that private ownership of the subsurface estate. So, so it gets into, you know, it all begins with the rock, but it doesn't end there. No. Uh, it, and, and that's probably a good place to hand the, the, the talking stick back to you. Cause don't get me started. No. Uh, I, I, 
another really interesting thing that I, I was I always like to go back and as I'm prepping for these, I go read the transcripts of the not only go read the presentations, but I like to at, listen to the questions that the analysts ask. And it's it's a lot of handshaking. I mean, none of these analysts are going to come out and say, oh, Chevron, you made the worst deal of all time. You know, they want to make ah. sure they can ask. They want to make sure they can ask a question at the next earnings call. They don't get booted from it. But one thing, you know, I am a big fan of Paul Sankey. Um, he's 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 kind of a legend in the oil research phase. He brought up an interesting question specifically around that production sharing contract, something that you brought up talking about um, specifically kind of the terms of the deal and that, you know, the, 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 the production, you know, PSC is kind of that technical term, as you would say, for the implicit contract you have between who's, you know, the, the, the oil operator and the government. And you mentioned that, you know, depending on where you are in the life cycle of the prospect, it it can it changes the at least from an M and A standpoint it changes uh, where you know, it changes sort of how the deal looks. Do you find you know because one of the things that Paul Sankey brought up was was there any risk to the production sharing contract that Exxon has and Chev and now that Chevron was is supposedly trying to buy has Chevron's going to enter into the risk around that contract. So and this is a opinion, but kind of tossing it back to you as a question is my assumption would be then based upon what you said of, hey, you know, if there's exploration, the government's going to take whatever deal terms a company throws at him because they're not sure if there's any oil there. But as you if you find oil and you hit oil, all of a sudden, I'm sure the government turns around and says, wait a second. Now we're looking at our deal terms here and our neighbors to the east have a lot better are making a lot more money off the same amount of oil we're making. So how is the these contracts and these production sharing contracts i assume over the the resource life cycle change are they do, can they change at will i mean can a government just come in and say yeah i know we agreed upon this for 2 years but we're only a year in and well, we want more money how how is that factored in from a risk standpoint oh that's the, the that becomes the game uh and i i uh from a several layers removed saw a master of it uh when i was at chevron mr ali bashiri was the president of the Africa Latin America uh, upstream company and Agbami, right? This monster field uh, uh, producing a fire hose of, of cash flow and playing defense on contract terms is a big part of the, uh, the biggest part, probably. And that's a relationship game. Uh, and and uh, was the master. And so, uh, and that's when it's like, oh, uh, you know, in terms of coming to this realization, well, the deal's the deal. Well, yeah, no. Get the deal that is a constant attempt to to retrade, or maybe no, no, no. We're going to honor the deal, but we're going to add this requirement that you invest X amount in educational skills mm. transfer, national uh, hires, a, a series of alternative take mechanisms that begin to evolve and are added to skimmers. And it's like, okay, what then? What is the the dance of where what's an ex, you know what okay we'll take an acceptable hit and the the uh for example the there's a a, a strike the 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 national all count the workers there go on strike your 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 in country offices are closed right you are not going in and so you know then everybody goes and and pounds on the table and then they end up getting another twenty five or fifty cents an hour labor opex is like. Not that it doesn't impact returns, but it is one of the lower or least impactful when you start doing sensitivity plots or, you know, in terms of what impacts mm. your returns. So it's like, okay, then, you know, you, 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 you shut down something in the legislature about an additional windfall profits tax or something, say, and then, but the, the, let the labor guys get their 50 cents an hour uh, increase. And then they go beat on their chest and their membership and throw some red meat on the table. And you go back to the board of directors and throw some red meat on the table. And then it's like, you know, and get ripped, ding, ding, and get ready for the next round. Uh, because it's just, it's a continual uh, uh, dance. Would be, was an observation that, that, that I saw in practice. And, and it's just the nature of, of the beast because you've got this irreversible uh, effectively stranded investment, right? That, the the only way that oil's getting moved is if you are there long enough to pump it out of the ground and and then the host country particularly the countries that have relatively speaking lower reserves and higher populations 
have a tremendous amount of internal uh, political pressure to maximize the, mm. the value extraction to the host country. Right. And so, um, so that, that's a very, that, that's just, it's, it's part of the landscape. And, and so the, the countries that do that, companies that do that effectively will be there for a very long time. Great case study there around Venezuela, right? They went through uh, what they called Empresas Mixta, which was uh, mixed companies. And it was moving to uh, more of direct ownership JV, but effectively a partial nationalization of the of the resource. And so uh, this is in the in the Faja, um, in the in the heavy oil in Venezuela. And when they were and when uh, and this was under Chavez, right? Um, it's Maduro currently. He was lieutenant of Hugo Chavez. So uh, when Chavez government was bringing that forward, then the Chevron guys put on their red ties, right, and and went and sat down at the table and talked with their their uh, uh, counterparts from the government. Exxon walked. They said, "We are no, we're not going to invest in your country if this is how you're going to play." And, and 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 both of them is it's a real one of the things that that uh you start a framework of analysis you can apply this stuff is looking at using explicit and quantitative game theoretic approaches and and it's not a rabbit hole that I really want to go down now there's some I can give you a couple suggestions of folks to talk to about that uh but there were sound reasons for both of those decisions and so uh if and when um, uh, Chevron is still producing in country, and in fact, even though the the uh, I guess sanctions went back on them because uh, Maduro isn't playing nice around letting a, a real election occur, the Chevron still got some license to produce to help pay back some debt. Uh, so they're still there. They're playing a very long game. The oil was there before Hugo Chavez. The oil was there before Maduro. The oil is there after Chavez. It'll still be there after Maduro. And and I believe so will Chevron. But that's their strategy and approach and how they play the game. Exxon, and being big enough to do it, Exxon can, can take the cost of that. And that's an investment in reputational, uh, uh, you, uh, 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 being a tough guy. I was going to use some other vocabulary, but uh, uh, being a tough guy. And so... Uh, it was because they weren't the only ones that walked. Conoco Phillips walked as well. If you, mm -hmm. this is going, this is maybe the way back machine for some folks, but Conoco Phillips walked as well, uh, which actually were accrued to the benefit of Chevron because the 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 value that the uh, Chavez government was looking to extract, they took out of the uh, Conoco Phillips position, who was a joint venture party in the 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 same asset with Chevron. In any case, without spending too much time on that, but it's the uh, so there's different approaches and how to go go at this stuff, but it's a continuing risk of the landscape internationally, and particularly given the scale often of these discoveries, like Guiana, which is absolutely I don't know, are they up to like 12 billion barrels of recoverable or something, um, some number comma very large, uh, and so uh, that's there's a lot of money there. And so, and if now there's other issues with Guyana because of the, the 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 very limited size of their economy and the lower smaller population base, what's the absorptive capacity of their economy for investment in cash um, effectively is, is becomes another question, elements of the resource curse and some other conversations you could have around that. Again, paths not to straight down at the moment, but uh it's it's a it's an interesting question. Pulling all the way back to where we started, Guyana is a Frontier is very uh, generous terms from a company perspective, uh, and but the political second guessing and the, that dance has already started in Guyana. Once the risk capital was spent, and it turned out that the imaginative geoscientists who came up with this crazy idea that there might be a boatload of oil offshore Guyana, let's go spend a couple hundred million dollars and figure out if that works. Uh, once we gin up some some co-ventures and a farm out deal, the, the farm out that was shopped pretty widely uh, before anybody knew what was there. And it, it was like it's like uh, a replay of what happened when Petrobras started drilling in the Santos Basin. 
which is around, you know, seven, eight, nine, I guess, but it was like, oh, they, and there's another billion barrel discovery and another billion barrel discovery and another billion barrel discovery. And, you know, and so, uh, but it, it's not Oprah, right? Because it's, it's Exxon. <laughs> they get a billion barrels and they get a billion barrels. Uh, anyways, uh, so uh, Exxon, Hess, and Sinook, which we haven't touched on, will come to the conversation at some point. Let me stop talking and, and head back to you before I, I uh, ramble too far down the, uh, a path that doesn't isn't germane to our conversation this morning. No, it, absolutely fascinating, and I think you know you it, it, that dance as you talked about between you know how once these agreements are in place, you're really it's a, it's how good is your relationship with your counterparty in the government? You mentioned that you know there's you know everyone's got to come back at these kind of renegotiations and, you know, said put a little bit of red meat on the table for both of their, both of their, their partners. I think it's, it's super interesting. And I think, you know, how that models into a lot of these offshore deals, I I think is fascinating. I want to kind of shift over specifically to Guyana before we dive into the deal from, from your perspective, how does, I mean, Guyana has, was, was, was discovered quote unquote, and, you know, kind of 2015, 2014 timeframe, started producing 2018, 2019. So you're talking about four years of risk capital being spent. Where is Where does Guyana fit as, a, as kind of a whole within kind of the, the new landscape of kind of where the oil and gas business is going? People have said it's the, the greatest oil discovery um, in the last 10 years. I probably agree with that. But where do you see kind of Guyana as a whole fitting into kind of the, the future of where oil and gas is going? Oh, well, it's, it's the, it is, uh, if not the greatest one of the, 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 the dream may be out. Let's see what, uh, how things work out offshore Namibia now, as the, they, they finally figured that out because a number of wells were drilled there, uh, before they, they got the figured out exactly what worked. Um, and, and that, that's one of the hallmarks of exploration at times too. You go out, you go drill the well, it's a duster. And what that does is inform you, uh, you know, uh, maybe you can figure out there's a working petroleum system, but the the exact play type may not have been the, the first idea. So and does the company have the appetite to go out and risk another uh, 50 or 100 or 150 or 200 million dollars uh, as a consortium to to go test that next idea? Um, so it it's a it's. I mean, it, it it's huge. It's it's a big prize. Uh, you know, what do we say? You know, over 10, 10 to 12 billion barrels of recoverable resource. And one of the really fascinating things is to see uh, Exxon approach it like uh, a mid-cap independent. And by that, I mean, the, the historically, the majors would go in and go in then and appraise the whole thing and look at it all and figure out the, the, the single most optimized way to develop the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And what Exxon did was go out and they found out we got like, we got a whole a bunch of oil here. And and there, there, there's probably more. But they in in to 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 go from discovery to first oil in a four-year cycle for any company is accelerated. And for a major is absolutely um extraordinary. And so, you know, let's just take a moment to recognize that. Kudos mm-hmm. to Exxon uh, as the operator. So, uh, uh, which then it improves your financial returns and and all those kind of characteristics. The so it's I mean it's it's a big uh, it's big. It's going to be you know in terms of where what percent of global production is an interesting question. And but really the most re- representative one is be what percent of global exports mm-hmm. is what you want to have because it's the the how much of that oil is getting traded and that and all the Guiana oil is getting traded. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's really the relevant unit of analysis or framework of analysis in my perspective. Um, and I don't know what the answer to that is, but it's, it's going to be some significant amount and it's part of the reordering of, of oil flows uh, around the world. One thing that, that it, it doesn't address is, and that's the need for heavy oil in the refinery stack in the U.S. Mm. And there's, you know, roughly speaking, there's kind of three kind of big buckets of quality uh, for oil. And an awful lot of the kit on the Gulf Coast in particular is geared towards heavier crudes, heavier and more sour, but heavier crudes in particular. And uh, and they're short of that because of the, the decline of production from Venezuela 
And because uh, Mexican Maya was one of the other big uh, lower grade crudes that was feeding the refinery complex for optimized uh, production for to, to get the for the most profitable utilization of those uh, uh, very complex refineries, they need a certain amount of that needs to be that heavier oil going into it. And so the makeup of the oil, it's not just the the total production, but the makeup of that or the quality of that production, and then where's the 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 natural home for that. Right, because uh, even though it's it's you know a straight shot, the the e even lighter sweeter stuff is coming from the onshore in the U.S. A and so you know where did where where's its home, you know, and is that going now? Not you know though I, I'm a, a chunk of that's equity production for Cena. I don't know if they're taking that all the way home, but it's you know or or there's a it's a you know it, it's it's uh it's fungible, right? It will. We'll, We'll exchange these millions of barrels here, and you give us those millions of barrels back closer to Asia mm. Pacific, and, and and that kind of stuff. But uh, it it matters. It's material it, on a global scale, and it's certainly uh, a feather in, in Exxon's cap, and and a, a good chunk of their uh, current and and more of their future cash flows. No, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, I think that's a that's a really interesting point of how much of the oil that you're producing is actually being exported versus just kind of being traded around um with, with within within you know whether it's the united states or abroad so very interesting i i i think you've done a great job of setting the stage so i want to kind of turn our attention to the the actual deal here so as, as people who listen to the podcast like to know i always like to start with the uh the the presentations as everybody knows chevron went ahead and took out and purchased Hess, who owns a 30% interest in this entire Guyana field or the 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 uh the block that is this I don't actually know how you pronounce is it the Starro block how do you pronounce I the think actual it's block Stabroic is what I've heard yeah, I do not know if that is correct but that's that's how I I've, I've been saying it so great so um this the Stabroa block they own about a 30% interest Exxon Mobil owns 45% of it and uh Chinese National uh, Offshore Oil Company um, Chinook, as I like to call it, they own um, about 25%. So you can see um, kind of the, the ratio there. But Chevron, having no interest in Guyana, decides to go uh, buy Hess. They, they announced this deal way back in October of 2023, which is super interesting as we read some of these transaction terms here. Um, they valued it at about a $60 billion valuation. If we can go ahead and bring up the slide here, if you're listening, um, I'm talking about slide four specifically on the uh, – um, Chevron Hess presentation, you'll see it's a hundred percent equity consideration, um, which again, I think is something interesting to talk about. Clearly Hess wants the ability to participate in the upside of Guyana and not necessarily sell out for a specific cash number, which I think there's something in there. Only a 10.3% premium, which I thought was maybe a little bit light, but going back to where the, you know, the hundred percent equity, there still is upside you know, now you're getting Exxon stock, so you have the ability for that uh, stock to appreciate as well. So the premium attached with that may or may not be um, something that is too concerned. John Hess is going to join the Chevron board of directors. And then I love this last part here. Target closing first half of 2024. Well, we swung and missed at that one. And, and this thing may not close till 2025. Um you know, the next slide they specifically talk about is Guyana. They they bring up, you know specifically um, all the different stuff, you know, 11 billion barrels of oil, about a 30% interest in that. You know, it's a super high cash margin. What's interesting is they also have a little bit of uh, uh, acreage and interest in Block 59, which is over in Suramine, which I don't know, you know, how, how that works specifically. I assume you have two different deals with both the Guyanese government and then the Suramine government, right? Yeah, there'll be, there'll be different uh, block contracts with the consortium of investors. Um, and then um, I must, it should have the same JOA, which is something we have, but it's the, there's the, there's the first level, which is how do we take, how do we divvy up the, the money that comes in for a barrel of oil? That's that production sharing contract. It's tax royalty in the States. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and those, there's some other schemes too, but those are the two biggies that you run into. And then, Another layer on that is the deal between the companies as the contractor group or the consortium, the joint venture partners. How do we 
how do we operate together, the joint operating agreement? And, and that's where the rubber hits the road in this question of, of interpretation that is in arbitration currently. But going back to the, the terms of the deal you were outlining. Yeah, no, I we're about to dive in, I think, deep to the JOA. Um, real quick, though, again, to kind of every, to give everybody a, a, an overview, we're looking now at slide six specifically. What are the three different areas? You know, Hess's, we know they have their big 30% stake in Guyana. They also have a big Bakken position and a much smaller Gulf of Mexico and uh, Malaysia position, which I think is is interesting. And to point out, we're not going to spend much time talking about their Bakken position, if only because the the most of the value of this deal comes from the Guyana position. And specifically, you know, one of the things I like to do is, is go run the PDP. All right, let's just take all the producing wells specifically in the United States and the Gulf of Mexico. Let's do a quick PDP analysis. If you're talking about a $60 billion deal, I get about 7 billion worth of PDP. And when you do the math on that, that's about 11% of the overall $60 billion value that's wrapped up in the PDP. Um, I, I go back to, I love Paul Sankey. He, he's quoted as saying of the $170 uh, dollar per share price that um, Chevron paid, he's attributing about $140 to Guyana, which means um, there's about 20% left over for the PDP. So obviously my PDP analysis isn't including a lot of the sticks that you could theoretically go drill in the Bakken. So sure, double that for the amount of uh, development that could happen. I, we're in the same ballpark there. But it goes to show that the majority of where Hess has gone and, and their stock, and, and this was pointed out in the earnings call, or not the earnings call, but the uh, um, the merger call was that their their stock is, over the last three years has been up 95% relative to the S&P 500, mainly off the back of the discoveries that just as you said, a billion barrels here, a billion barrels here. So super interesting. And, you know, I think this deal would have been, you know, pretty easy to cover and pretty easy to talk about. And when it first happened, the big question was, hey, Exxon, how are you going to work with Chevron? And what's funny is the first reaction out of Exxon was, oh, we work with Chevron around the world. We will continue to do that, blah, 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 blah. Well, then about two weeks later, things got a little things got a little interesting. And there was form, you know, from from October until about January, February, this was all secret. But what 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 we discovered was that two weeks into the deal, somebody at Exxon put their hand up and said, wait a second, guys. We might actually have first right of refusal on any deal that happens in Guyana based upon the joint operating agreement that we signed. And they were stuck in secret negotiations for about four months until in you know mid-February, the you know, Exxon kind of came out and said, guys, we're we're moving this to arbitration. We and, and I love this quote um, you know, from from Exxon, we know what's in the deal because we wrote the deal. And I think this is super interesting in terms of um, the the politics at play here. So, from you know, to from your standpoint, how, you know, before we dive into some of the specific JOA language, how does some of this stuff develop? You know, obviously Chevron and Hess they come agree upon the deal. Hess knows about the JOA because they were involved; they signed it. Chevron probably got access to it as part of the data room, or should have. Yeah. Definitely, so, that would be a, would have been a significant point of due diligence, and they definitely got a ton of scrutiny from Chevron lawyers and directly informed the manner in which they structured the transaction. No doubt about it. In terms and, of the, the now, now what is it intent versus what is literal meaning, and then how that's interpreted. Uh, yeah, that that that's the dance that we're engaged in currently. Well, I think. As you said it, it's intent versus plain English. There's a lot of lawyers that are going to, this is a, a lawyer's wet dream because, you know, now we get to, we get to sit down and, and argue language here. So talk to me about the idea. And I guess before we do that, let me, let, let's read here that Javier Bly is, we, we, we talked about this prior to, to, to going live here. He wrote a great article that kind of lays out what the different what the actual point of contention here is. And the point of contention is the idea of within every JOA for these large agreements, you have this change of control, which goes in there. And while we don't know specifically what that JOA says, there's only three parties that know that. And what's funny is two of them think one thing, Exxon thinks another. And now uh, um, uh, uh, Chinese National Oil Company has joined the arbitration. So it's really 2v2 here. But really... The idea is 
what does that change of control look like? Um, and again, well, one of the top executives at, 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 at Exxon, Neil Chapman, this is his quote on March 6th. We understand the intent of this language of the whole contract because we wrote it, which is super, which is, as a matter of fact, to say, hey, we know better than you because we wrote it. But what 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 Javier Blay has showed was that he he basically did a draft JOA, which is something that's ninety four pages long. Holy smokes! But this is a the Association of International Energy Negotiators model contract, which is I mean this is all the way back from two thousand two. But most likely this was the basis to build the JOA, and within that, and we'll throw this quote up here because I'm not going to necessarily read the whole thing because it's it's a little bit. Um, uh, to lawyer read, but basically change of control means any direct or indirect change of a control of a party, whether through merger, sale of shares, or other equity interest or otherwise, in which the market value of the party's participating interest represents some percentage of the aggregate market value of the assets of such a party and its affiliates that are subject to change of control. For the purposes of this definition, the market shall be determined based upon the amount in cash a, a willing buyer would be and a willing seller uh, or would be willing, um, I'm, yeah, a, a willing buyer would pay a willing seller in an arm's length transaction. I'm going to just throw it back to you to kind of get your thoughts on that. But I, I, this does go back to the 100% equity discussion as well. It's, uh, I don't think there's a plain English language version of this conversation. <laughs> Let me just put it out there like that. Uh, and I, there was a uh, Javier Blas article, uh, or however you correctly pronounce his name, it, is, uh, is great. Uh, then, uh, I, uh, ran into a, a, another, I'm a member of the AIEN, formerly AIPN Association of International Energy Negotiators. Uh, and so, uh, and there's some question as well, is it the, the, the 2002 model contract that was employed or was it the 2012? Because, uh, one of the, the things that, that AIEN does is it develops these, you know, taking, decades of painful learning from from uh, uh, members and the experience of other companies that then develop these model contracts and reduce the issues in play to a set of multiple choice elections. So then they're basically pretty much every issue that's ever come up is laid out on the table and here's the the buckets and, and a lot of times a term sheet um, in developing a term sheet for a deal right in the stages before you get to uh, a signed letter of intent, you're going to be swapping term sheets back and forth. In that term sheet would be, we're going to use AIEN for model contract for the basis for our jailing. Mm. So, you know, so you get that, that negotiating principle out there and then that really corrals the conversation, focuses it, directs it, makes it much more productive rather than trying to rewrite from a, a blank slate, a new joint venture agreement, which mean it may miss uh, covering some issues that you know end up being uh, a huge uh, hairball at some point in the future. So, so it's a, a super valuable uh, tool, set of tools, really, because there's uh, gas sales agreements. There's just about anything under the sun that mm -hmm. is part of an oil and gas deal. That there's a model contract form for. It. So, um, so is it the 2002 contract or the 2012 contract, uh, a model contract? And there's some very minute variations in the language of definitions there, but this whole thing may turn on minute variations of definitional language. Uh, another member of AIEN, a gentleman named James English, wrote a great uh, and, and super down in the weeds uh, post on LinkedIn for this. And I reposted it and, and threw the TLDR on top, which is like still a jump ball. Uh, and and that's I mean so I uh, I am not a lawyer and I ain't even gonna try to you know I'm not even gonna pretend I slept at a Holiday Inn Express last night, um, but uh, uh, it, yeah so it it does turn on the, this very you know almost esoteric very definitional stuff where's the comma uh, uh, almost kind of grade of of parsing of this language on one level the other one is then you get into arbitration. Uh, well, let's before we go with arbitration in Paris uh, under UK law, I think is the relevant law here too. It's not in the US and what what probably most of your podcast listeners are going to be used to is the US approach to things, which is very averse to restrictions on sales of shares. 
So in the U.S., there basically there's kind of two frames. You do an asset level deal, which is like, okay, I'm just going to sell you. If we use the Guyan example, I'm just going to sell you my chunk of the Stabroic block. In that case, under the typical U.S. setup, if there's a rofer in there, a right of first refusal, no question that applies. No question about it. In the U.S., in the typical U.S. practice, if it was a corporate deal, uh, then it almost certainly would not. Because there's the the, the change of control, uh, almost without exception in the U.S., extinguishes the rofer if it's a provision in the JLA. That's sort of the industry practice or, or close to industry standard. That's I can say that. What uh, what what becomes, you know, internationally, then it's it's a much less clear cut case, and there's a lot more host co countries have to say about approving people, and there's you know the the question, particularly these very large investments uh, that need to happen. And at the tail end of life are going to be some very large decommissioning obligations that need to be met. Um, then there's there's a legitimate interest of companies in making sure they got a counterparty that can perform, or, or avoiding counterparties that are otherwise you know sanctioned parties or or some some other uh, color or issue that would make them not a suitable co venture. So. Um, so this is where you get into then, and then now we're, it's into this, uh, into the arbitration arena. Uh, and so it, it becomes, it's a little squishier maybe. Uh, and so, uh, it, so then it's the, 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 okay, what's the, um, what's the result of that going to be? Oh, I mean, and that's the, you know, in terms of the, the opinion, the, the, in, in some respects, the more interesting question to me becomes, this gets back to that game theoretic framework, what game are we actually playing here? Mm. Is Exxon trying to buy that? I, I'm not convinced that, you know, the election to take that piece of the deal is necessarily what they're after. Um, but if they're, what they're after is the enforceable right to do so, mm. then what you, they have then is a lever to extract concessions and enhance the returns on their existing investments. Interesting. Flesh that out a little more. What do you mean by the enforceable? How would that increase? Is just okay, the ability so, to? So, for yeah. example, there's been literally billions of dollars of investment into these contracts, and 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 it's still happening. Uh, and in the pre-production assets, the balances are accruing, and that those monies have been invested by Hess. CNUC and Exxon. Under a PSC, there's what they call cost recovery. So, you know, and it varies by contract. It might be the first 50% of revenues or a cap at 70% of revenues. It might be uncapped. I mean, the but typically there's some limit to that. Some amount of the revenues are going to be exposed to government take. But the all the that that capex, all the, at the front, basically at the front end of production. All the risk capital that's gone into the asset can be recovered. Your cost recovery to to create uh, uh, some some returns then to divvy up uh, accrues to the to the invest the the consortium right to the the contractors. Uh, contractors group is often how that's referred to within the PSC contract terms. So there can be an, a, a side agreement of disproportionate capital recovery. That was the hallmark of a deal. Uh, the first thing that I did at Anadargo when I landed there was figure out what was going on in a deal that had disproportionate cost recovery so that the previous investors get the, the money back that the other party invested, the one that sold. Okay. And so, so what that would be then, that's like, so, uh, so, and the but everything else uh, gets divvied up, and there'll be some fraction of that typically. But it's it what that then is like. Okay, they're getting, uh, they would get it. You know, it's like and it, and if you don't let you know, agree to the shake now, uh, that may be not the right characterization either. But you know, if you don't uh, uh, find these terms acceptable, then we're going to elect on our rofer, which then blows up the transaction because. 
um, a condition precedent for close. My understanding is this: that a prediction condition precedent for closing the Chevron Hess merger is that the transfer of the the Guiana asset to Chevron. That doesn't happen. The deal doesn't happen. At the same time, my understanding of the Rofer language is the transaction must close for the Rofer provision to be effective. So, so it, it's either the deal proceeds or there is no deal. And, and if there's no deal, then there's no election and, and Exxon would have to go do its own acquisition of, of all of Hess, not just this piece. And I don't think they're interested in the Bakken or the, the production in the Gulf of Mexico uh, and the Malaysia fit. So, um, so it's, you know, what is, what's the game that's being played here? They're actually, uh, have you ever seen the movie, the princess bride? Yes. The battle of wits. What yes. is the game that's actually being played? Okay. That, and that's not original. That was Frank Cook at, at uh Chevron used that in a, in a lunch and learn around game theory uh, applications. And, and it was, it was a great frame anyways. Um, so could that that could be in play they could be interested just in 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 keeping you know blowing up the deal keeping chevron out uh maintaining uh uh their supremacy if you will within guiana my under what i've heard is that the the guyanese government is very interested in having chevron come into there as a counterweight to exxon in, in and have you know and uh even more so perhaps as an additional counterweight to the saber rattling going on next door by Maduro talking about the, um, oh, is it the Esquivel? Uh, sorry, the, there's some uh, terrain that's supposed to be in historically Venezuelan oh, yeah. and, and we're going to come in and you're taking our oil and blah, 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 blah. You know, it's the, all, and, and that, you know, there's a dynamic within Venezuela that then turns the, the Venezuelan public away not to be focused internally on all the disasters that are unfolding within that country because of how it's being mismanaged, but rather on those those dirty gringos and the 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 Guyanese who are plundering Venezuela's natural resources. So um that's a different game and topic. But uh uh so what is it what's in play? What's what are they really trying to accomplish here? Uh would they like to exercise on that? Maybe that is really what they'd like to happen. But uh, that doesn't appear to be one of the potential outcomes as the conditions precedent requirements for the transaction to proceed as outlined by Chevron. Mm -hmm. So, so then what is it that they, they, what, what's the, what's the win for them here? Well, that defines the game then. Right. And so what is that? What is the game that they're actually playing and that and Chevron may have just been playing hardball with them and saying you know and exxon said hey we got this this rofer you give us some sugar and uh and they were like nope so what so, you're saying is exxon's been building up their tolerance to iocane powder over the past five years to uh sustain this <laughs> for those of you who are princess bride fans uh that may be the case so um yeah, so it's 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 fascinating stuff, and it's it will be interesting to see. And it's uh, you know, and I, uh, I'd like to see it proceed. I mean, but I, I don't know that I could make an informed probability assessment that will occur. So it, why you 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 said I don't mean to cut you off here, but you said another thing really interesting of that the Guyanese government is really interested in having Chevron there as a counterweight to Exxon. Why does the Guyanese government necessary? What's why would they care? They're getting their money regardless, and they can they can bully. They they feel like they might have the right to bully whoever. Well, I don't know that they. Yeah, the okay. You're. I don't think there's a lot of Guyanese bullying going on. Let okay. me just say that. Uh, but I, I have not been in the room. So, uh, and then Exxon, uh, reputationally, has got the the. They are a, a hard nosed. Um, take no prisoners player and they have they've invested significant uh i mean they and they play the game well and and that's you know and they they made this they made this happen this discovery this development and this to, to be in this wonderful conundrum that that exists today so you know hats off um 
so but the ability of the government to influence Exxon is probably honestly is probably quite limited mm. but mm. uh and Hess ain't gonna influence Exxon and they, Hess has been like uh as the as the, the 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 cash calls have come from Exxon cash call after cash call after cash call to invest in this stuff and it's like what a great problem to have Exxon's been I mean Hess has been out there flipping the sofa cushions and shit you know turning little kids over for their lunch money to try to keep up with the the pace and the scale of the investment that Exxon's been undertaking and wouldn't that be a wonderful problem to have so uh so they're not you know they're their ability to Im and then uh uh Sinook, the Chinese National Offshore Oil Company, is uh uh they've got subsidized capital. So that isn't hasn't been an issue for them. Mm -hmm. And and they were um smart enough to take the this risk when you know pretty much the whole industry went and, and looked at the Stabroic block and its prospectivity ex ante before the first well was drilled and and you know by uh, took a pass. Or weren't ready to to meet Exxon's uh, terms, so um, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question, but but it's it's uh, it's going to be the a player of equal scale, you know, someone who's mm. they're not, you know, how many thousand pound gorillas are there? It's yep. it's a pretty small population, right? So you got a thousand pound gorilla that's got you know doing this this thing, and it's pretty much. Uh, you can ask it nicely, but as the host country government with with previously having uh, a very small economy, uh, a small population, um, you know, without the the uh, legal muscle, without the, the you know, all the, the, the and then having a set of terms that they agreed to in advance because there was no production. Mm -hmm. And and then it's, you know, then, you know, and then it, now they find themselves uh, in this position working with Exxon. At the same time, they're playing defense politically, domestically, right? Because now you suddenly, because Exxon came in and risked, you know, whatever the first well was, $100 million or, you know, pick a number. Uh, there's this, you know, huge... Uh, bounty of, of cash but now the, the the domestic players are coming out and saying oh you gave away the natural endowment of the country and this and the, you know and all the armchair quarterback and that goes on uh and and you know they and and it's you know it's they may be sincere or maybe just to try and gain political advantage or you know those are and those aren't necessarily mutually exclusive mm -hmm. um so it becomes problematic then for the host country to get, you know, it's like, okay, well, the, did they become more vulnerable by then getting, you know, it's, so it, it's a complex, you know, they're in a, in a complicated situation as well. So then the, the, the whole issue of what's going on next door and everything. And it's like the, um, certain, there are certainly American interests to protect, uh, if if there are any conflict that developed, but it wouldn't hurt to have Exxon and Chevron banging on Washington saying, protect our interests, right? Yeah, no, super, super interesting. And I think you bring up a good point of, you know, the, the first question I had is why would you sell if you're Hess? You've got, you've, you've somehow backed yourself into 30% of what probably is going to be the best resource play going forward for the next 10 years now, but you bring him an interesting point. They they've spent a lot of capital. They're, they're looking under the mattresses. They're shaking everybody they can to figure out how they can come up with the CapEx to actually invest and, and keep up with these cash calls. I think it's interesting. So Chevron has come out and said, if that, if Exxon prevails in arbitration, it's not going to go forward with Hess. The Hess, which I think is interesting. It means they're really only in this for access to Guyana. They could care less about the Bakken. They could care less about all this other stuff. Exxon really hasn't necessarily come out and showed their hand. What what? And, and so I'm interested, you know, I you know, to kind of not wrap this up, but you know, 
obviously we're we're not going to be able to figure out who's going to win. If we knew who was going to win, we'd be lawyers or we'd just be gamblers. Um, because it's going to come down to if you if you read the article that we'll list here in the description, it's going to come down to a few interpretations of words. Um, so here's the uh, here's my my one question to you. You're Exxon Mobil in this. What you know from a guarantee period game theory perspective, what is Exxon hoping to get out of this outcome um, by trying to block this merger? Well, it's the, the like going back to what's the game question. Is it a block? You know, it's like, uh, and it, it, it could be that there are a set of outcomes that would be acceptable to Exxon. Blocking it may be one of those under certain circumstances. Uh, for example, now, and, and it'd be like, okay, Exxon, to start with, they're going to arbitration because they simply de- which creates delay now is the delay in itself a viable uh uh goal for exxon i don't think so i mean i you know why go to the trouble and expense uh let's just to be obstreperous maybe but i don't think so i mean i think they they have uh they're looking for something that will uh financially benefit their shareholders mm-hmm. and so it's like okay uh, and they may, you know, then, uh, so we go to arbitration uh, as agreed to within the terms of the, whichever version of the AIEN model contract was, was written into the JOA. So going to, and what do you want to come out? You want an enforceable right. Out of it. So if it decides on Exxon's behalf, then Exxon says we're exercising or Exxon says Chevron can, let's reopen that conversation about cost recovery, disproportionate cost recovery, or, or whatever may or may not have been a topic of discussion or how, you know, we will be prepared to give up this right and, and not break your deal for sufficient consideration. And then it's, it's a dance. It's a negotiation about what uh, amount and form of that cons- consideration would take. So, um, but uh, yeah, an enforceable right of first refusal is what Exxon wants out of the arbitration. And then the question becomes, what would they do with that? Now, you know, keeping Guyana as their, as uh, them as the sole uh, super major, uh, a sole IOC in there, is that a sufficient, is there enough value in that win? Or I mean, or why would you, why would you pursue this route? Um you know, what is the motivation to do that? What are the winning conditions? What's the game? Uh, getting back to that question then. So I just kind of try to test out some of these other things that come, come as a result. And and it's, you know, it's like, okay, well, you know, profit maximization is the notional, you know, there's strategic elements and how you get to their long term. But uh, something then that would say, okay, we think because we put this all, we made this happen. If you want to come in Chevron, we need... We need to sweeten the deal for us. Mm, That's my my swag. Uh, without getting spelling out the particulars, but yeah, that's my silly swag about uh, what Exxon may be seeking out of the deal. And then if they have they have something of value to exchange with Chevron, if they indeed have an enforceable rofer, as they claim was the original intent of the joint operating agreement. Fascinating. I think, you know, if, if Chevron wins, we're going to see a new, uh, the 2025 uh, template for JOA. They're going to be a new template come out for sure. They, um, yeah, there's, I mean, there, they, they, they get, there's revisions that, that are done, but as I said, there's a suite of these contracts that are uh, produced by AIEN that uh, practitioners use. And, and they are, uh, there's always something in, in, um, revision for the next version, but it gets it's gets a significant amount of study. Uh, a, a lot of perspectives come in on it, and it's so it's uh, it's a real uh, it's an informed industry perspective on on what the issues are, what the selections might be. So then there's this framework to apply and and make for a a, a smoother path to a better deal for all parties. Yeah, it's. 
Regardless, you know, the last quote in uh, in, in in the article that we read a lot from Javier Blias is that um, there's a lot at stake here for the future of big oil. So it's it's super fascinating. I, I really appreciate you sitting down today and 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 diving into all of this this contract language. I, I I know I learned a lot. I know our listeners learned a lot. Before I let you go, is there anything else surrounding this these negotiations that you feel is Im- Im- important to to think about as we're as we're all trying to come to our own conclusions? Well, it, it's what's fascinating to me, just a quick observation, anything in terms of uh, how much of the, the conversation, the M&A conversation has been uh, focused on onshore. And when we say onshore, then there's all this embedded understanding of we're talking about unconventional onshore in the U.S. And so uh, it uh, remains l- almost exclusively a U.S. game. The only other place that's really hot that I know of and, and that hasn't been focused mine is Argentina. Um, and, and there's interesting stuff happening there in terms of above ground issues that make it more amenable to investment. Um, but that that this announcement by Chevron that they were going to take out Hess primarily to get into Guyana really kind of seemed to wake up the financial world and, and maybe a bit of the industry around like, oh, yeah, there's this offshore business, too. <laughs> And in fact, uh, I'm also a member of uh, SPE, Society of Petroleum Engineers, and uh, uh, their A&D group had a, 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 an event around offshore M&A. And that was mm. the first A&D group thing I went to in about three years because everything else has been 100% unconventional onshore. Yep. And and that uh, that, just, that hasn't been my where most of my experience was I did originate uh, Chevron's acquisition of Chesapeake's Delaware Basin acreage, about a quarter million acres, billion plus deal, and uh, uh, participated in, in some smaller stuff um, at Murphy around mm-hmm. Eagleford Shale and, and that, uh, that area. So uh, familiar with it, but the bulk of the experience has been more uh, offshore and international, which is... Uh, almost implicitly part of offshore and, and certainly for these uh, disruptive discoveries for the, the big new fields is a, an offshore exploration game, international offshore exploration. And thanks for having me. No, absolutely. I, again, I, I learned a lot. I know our listeners learned a lot. I appreciate everybody who, who tuned with us. We went over an hour here. So that's, that's awesome. Um, as I always like to finish with guys, we'll be back for the next deal.